Okay, welcome everybody to the weekly Bootstrap seminar, which has been a tradition for, I say, I think about a year by now. Uh, and we are very happy today to have Ife Hay from uh, Ecole Normale in Paris tell us about the S matrix Bootstrap in three plus one dimensions, regularization, and dual problem. Thank you. Okay, I'll start. <clears throat> Okay, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I want to thank Slava for giving me the chance to speak here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the S matrix bootstrap in three plus one dimensions. And I'm going to focus on the regularization and the dual problem. This is based on this uh, very recent paper together with Martin Kruchensky. <clears throat> So uh, the plan of the talk is the following. I'm going to start with a brief introduction where I'm going to recall the basic framework of S-matrix bootstrap. And since the uh, main topic is the dual problem, I'm going to recall some of the key ideas in formulating the dual problem in one plus one dimensions. And then the main part, I'm going to construct a dual problem in three plus one dimensions. To do this, I'm going to first argue the need for regularization. And then I will formulate the dual problem in two different ways. First, I will formulate the dual problem using uh, the language of conic optimization. And then uh, I will re revisit it using a complex analysis uh, so that we get a different perspective on the problem. And for this, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce some concepts such as the dual amplitudes and the dual partial waves. After that, I will show you some numerical test results of the formulation, and the end are the conclusions. And the whole formulation will be done in the context of uh, scalar particle scattering, which is related to pion physics. And for uh, the majority of the talk, I'm going to basically focus on single flavor pion for its simplicity. But at certain point, I will summarize the result for uh, the case with the uh, own global symmetry. <clears throat> So we start with uh, considering a two to two scattering of identical scalar particles, which you can think of as a single flavor pion. And then uh, Lorentz invariance requires that uh, the S matrix depends on the Mandelstam variables S, T, and U. And we have the constraint that S plus T plus U equals to four. And for the talk, I'm going to take the, sim uh, for simplicity, I'm going to take the mass of the particle, which is a lightest particle in the theory to be one. And then the scattering amplitude is a function of the, uh, of the Mandelstam variables, uh, st and u. We are going to assume maximal analyticity, which says that the amplitude is an analytic function in st and u, with the only singularities corresponding to on-shell processes, which could be the bound states and the multiple particle threshold. But in our case, we're going to consider no bound state and the simplest case with only multiple particle threshold. And for the two particle threshold, these correspond to uh, cuts in the amplitude for s larger than four, t larger than four and u larger than four. In addition, we'll have crossing symmetry, which says in the case of single flavor pion, the amplitude is, uh, uh, is the same when we exchange the STU. And in the case of ON, it will be slightly more complicated, but not too much. Then on the other hand, this is what we see in a real scattering experiment. We have two particles with a certain uh, energy momentum coming in. And when the total energy S is larger than the two particles threshold, then after they sc scatter, there are two particles coming out uh, at a certain, certain scattering angle theta. The scattering angle theta is related to the Mandelstam T variable in this way. And uh, in the physical scattering process, it takes the value between zero and pi, which correspond to this range of T between four minus S and zero. So this uh, range of S larger than four, T between four minus S and zero are the physical region, uh, which happens when in a, a scattering experiment. And in this region, the amplitude can be projected onto a cer certain angular momentum, which are the partial uh, partial waves, and uh, then the unitarity is imposed on the partial scattering amplitudes, which is related to the partial waves in this way. 
which is also related to the phase shift, which can be directly measured in an experiment. And the unitarity says that the partial scattering amplitude for the physical energy uh, has modulus less than one for uh, any angular momentum. Uh, so these uh, analyticity crossing and unitarity are the basic constraint that we require for the 2 to 2 s matrix. And the modern approach uh, started with these pioneer papers uh, from Miguel, John, uh, John Toledo, Bolt, and uh, Pedro, where they started with the construction of an S matrix that is consistent with all the constraints that we mentioned before, and studied the problem of putting bounds on physical couplings in one plus one and three plus one dimensions. In a more general context, this is a way to map out the space of S matrices by maximizing some linear functional, which for instance can be chosen to be the amplitude evaluated at some kinematic point S naught, T naught, U naught. And once we manage to do that, we'll be able to examine the boundary of the space of consistent S matrices and ideally compare with experiments. And sometimes we also find that interesting theories are located at special points, uh, such as the vertex on the boundary of the space, as we have seen in the 2D case. Uh, in, in one plus one dimensions, uh, we have a uh, pretty good control of how to map out this space of S matrices. Um, previously, together with Lucia and uh, Martin and Pedro, we got this uh, 2D ON monolith, which is a, a, a map of the space of ON theories in two dimensions. And today I'm going to uh, describe how to do this effectively for three plus one dimensional uh, two to two S matrices. So uh, in the study of the uh, one plus one dimensional S space of S matrices, we introduced a new tool, which is called the dual problem. This was also later generalized to other cases by Andrea uh, Alessandro and uh, Pedro. The idea is that uh, instead of constructing some S matrices that's consistent with all the constraints uh, and approach the boundary of the space from inside, the dual problem allowed to approach the boundary of the space from outside and therefore um, will be able to obtain some strict outer boundary of the space. And in one plus one dimensions, this has uh, provided an alternative and efficient way of mapping out the space of S matrices. Uh, and recently, there are many new developments in studying the higher dimensional S matrix bootstrap. In higher D, there's even more need for formulating such a dual problem. As a simple motivation, I'm going to mention this example, which comes from this original paper here. And we will also use, it, use this example in the end for a numerical test of our formulation. So the problem is to maximize the amplitude evaluated at the crossing symmetric point as TU equals to four thirds uh, in the context of single flavor pion. And in the problem that was studied in this paper here, uh, this has the physical meaning of putting bound on uh, quartic couplings for single pion scattering. There, it was observed that the maximum was attained by an amplitude which has a pole at the multiple particle threshold. And if one includes such a pole in the setup of the S matrix bootstrap, then the program has a very good convergence. But if one does not include it in the setup, then the convergence is bad. And ideally, we would like to be able to explore the space of S matrices without assuming such structure, but rather to discover them uh, as a result of the bootstrap. And this is something that we believe that the dual problem will be able to do. <clears throat> uh, so since we're going to formulate the dual problem in three plus one dimensions, I'm going to first recall some uh, key ideas of formulating the problem in one plus one D. 
uh, in this case, we can consider uh, an amplitude evaluated at a certain point as not, which uh, could, for example, is between zero and four. And then we want to find a bound on this quantity. This is given by a Cauchy integral in this form. And uh, the observation there was that um, the same evaluation can be done by considering some arbitrary analytic function k of s, which has a pole at s equals to s naught. Uh, with residue one, then if we multiply these two functions and do the contour integral, this will pick up the same value that we want to evaluate and, evaluate and maximize. Now we can blow up the contour rapid around the cut and drop the con uh, contribution from infinity, suppose that's possible. And then um, uh, given certain properties of the K, this evaluation can be converted into an integration in the physical region where we have the unitarity constraint. And then by a series of inequalities, which uh, in particular include unitarity, we will be able to eliminate the um, uh, amplitude from this expression and therefore obtain some strict upper bound of the quantity that we try to maximize. And this gives the dual functional, which is written in terms of the K. And uh, after that, we will minimize um, this functional. Uh, suppose uh, that K satisfy the properties that we assume in this derivation. And this provides the optimal bound for uh, the quantity that we try to maximize. And this is a basic. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes. Can you explain why is this an optimal bound? Because you 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 went through this. I mean, it's clear that you will get some bound, but is it obvious that you will always be find be able to find a function k of s so that his bound is going to be optimal? Uh, are you trying to say why the equality should hold? Yeah. For example, I, mean, ah. I don't know. Maybe there's some simple reason. Ah, I mean, this equality holds is a result of a com uh, uh, the duality in conic optimization. And uh, uh, there's also some um, there's also some continual version in some function, uh, some theorem in the functional analysis that uh, guaranteed this. But uh, are you going I'm to explain this later? No, I mean. But I mean, um, this clearly has to rely on some properties of analytic functions. So it's not not just some uh, analysis here, uh, uh, optimization. I mean, because the, so so I mean this. So I mean the the first equality here would correspond to that the the maybe it will become a little bit more clear later when I go to the conic optimization, but I'm okay. not going to say this very explicitly, but there, if uh, it's not clear, you can ask again. Okay. Okay. Uh, so now we start setting up the S matrix bootstrap problem for three plus one dimensions. Uh, in this case, we will write the amplitude as a double dispersion relation in this way, which uh, the amplitude is then parameterized by a double spectral density rho of x, y. And this is the Mandel sum representation, which uh, automatically encodes this uh, maximal analyticity and the crossing property. So we can draw some diagram to indicate the kinematic regions where the axes are uh, real s and real t. Then the um, amplitude uh, has its, the boundary of the analytic region is for s larger than four, t larger than four, and the, the crossed regions, which I'm indicating with um, red. And we can also include some additional uh, single dispersion relation and a constant term, which take care of the subtraction. But for the talk, I'm going to mainly focus on the double dispersion relation here because uh, this is the main feature of higher dimensional scattering. For the single dispersion, it's very similar to 2D. So we have uh, already understood that very well. And then, as we said before, the unitarity is imposed in the physical kinematic region uh, onto the partial waves. And uh, to plot it here, uh, these are given by the green regions, uh, where for the S channel is S larger than 4, T between 4 minus S and 0. And we also have the crossed regions. Alternatively, one can also consider to map this uh, double cut plane planes to a double disk 
through this map. And after this map, the cuts are mapped to the boundaries of the double disks. And the physical region for S larger than four, T smaller than zero, are mapped to the upper half circle for the disk for S and uh, this green segment here for uh, the disk for T. And then we also have the crossed regions. And then in this case, the amplitude is uh, written as the series expansion in this double disks variables. This is, this is equivalent to the triple disk variables that uh, was considered in this paper if we use the constraint that S plus T plus U equals to four. <clears throat> So uh, the problem that we try to solve is essentially that through a maximization problem, we're trying to find the double spectral density given that our amplitude uh, is constrained by unitarity in the physical region, which I'm going to recall, uh, sorry, uh, I'm going to refer to as the data because this is the region where we have these partial waves, which can be, for example, measured in an experiment. And the relation of the, these two, uh, the spectral density and the, the amplitude is through an uh, integral equation, which is given by the mandel stump representation. And this is a Fredholm equation of the first kind. It is known that when the kernel here, integration kernel here is continuous, the problem of finding the uh, row here is an ill post problem. The reason can be explained with a simple example. Suppose we can uh, we have uh, we have to solve this integral equation here for rho with a given continuous kernel k. Then suppose we have a solution rho. Then we can shift it by some uh, high oscillation with a large amplitude, which after integrating against this continuous kernel hardly modify the function f of s here. So the problem here is essentially that a small error in the data can change the solution dr drastically and one would have to have an infinite precision to solve such a problem. In the S matrix bootstrap problem, in the case of single dispersion relation, like in one plus one dimensions, we have a kernel that is singular because in this case, X is integrated on the boundary of the analytic region, which goes from four to infinity. And S is in the physical region, which is also four to infinity. So the kernel is singular and solving for the spectral density is a well-posed problem. In three plus one dimensions, we have a double dispersion relation, which has a kernel like this. The first part is fine, but the second part, we integrate y from four to infinity, and the t is taken to be the physical region, which um, goes from four minus s to zero. So solving for the double spectral density is an ill post problem. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, this is post. Is it the problem of matter of practice or of principle? Like, for example, do you really I think mean, that there are two different spectral densities which give the same f? Uh, I mean, it's it's. I think it's both in practice and in principle. So in this case, it's not that the kernel has uh, any zero mode or anything. Different. Yeah. Um, we we still have, um, uh, like if you know the amplitude precisely, you will be able to recover the row. But the problem that we try to solve is that we have the amplitude constrained in a certain region. Um, okay. And so it's, yeah. Okay. So uh, a standard resolution to this issue uh, is the so-called Tikhonov regularization. In this case, instead of solving for this equation here, one consider a minimization problem where the first term here uh, take care of finding some good solution row that satisfy this equation. And uh, there's another term which uh, one introduce a certain norm for the row variable. And the minimization has the purpose of uh, suppressing some high oscillation that has no physical interest. So in our case, we have a, a maximization problem where we maximize some linear functional, but we will also use some idea like the second term here, which uh, we introduce some norm for the double spectral density. Sorry, Ife, can, can I ask you, yeah. so in the, in the primal problem, when we solved it with this uh, series in, in your Z variables, this series, yes. um, why did oh. it work? Like, why, why this? Um, 
Probably. I suppose, uh, I mean, you, I suppose you use some uh, uh, really arbitrary precision calculation. Or maybe, maybe a different way to ask the question. So perhaps what you're saying is that these coefficients rho and m for large n and m are like not really converging in the numerics, but then perhaps for the targets we were looking at, we we could get reliable. for for large n and m, um, this these um, rows will hardly change the the yeah. the functional the, here in the physical region, right? Yes. So maybe maybe if we go back and analyze carefully how they were. If they were converging, we will learn, we will see this issue. Maybe that's what you were trying to say. Because we, we were not looking at all coefficients, we were only looking at the function. Okay. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to state the, uh, the key elements of the primal problem here. Uh, first, we have a linear functional, which uh, for instance, is given by the amplitude evaluated at some point S naught T naught. And in general, this can be written as some uh, integration of the uh, double spectral density row of XY with a certain coefficient A of XY. And um, then there's a linear relation which relates the row of XY to uh, the partial waves in the physical region. Uh, the, operate, the linear operator here in this integration uh, encodes all the analyticity and crossing property. This is, for example, given by the foissart gribov formula. The third part of the primal problem is a cone condition. This uh, it comes from unitarity. So the unitarity constraint itself is not in the form of a cone, but it can be transformed into the form of a cone by using some trivial uh, linear constraint. So as a geometrical picture, you can imagine to intersect this cone with a plane, which gives rise to the unitarity constraint. And it's convenient to uh, um, formulate this in the, in the cone language for the derivation of the dual problem. Uh, so to summarize that the primal problem we would try to solve is uh, to find a maximum of some linear functional overall row with a certain linear constraint and the cone condition. And the dual problem, which provides the strict upper bound of the primal functional, follows um, directly from the duality of conic optimization. In this case, one can consider dual cone variables, which are made of the vectors, vectors which has a positive, uh, sorry, non-negative inner product with the primal cone. Uh, variables. So for the geometrical picture, the primal cone that we had is a quadratic cone, which comes from the unitarity constraint. And in this case, the dual cone are also quadratic cones. And we're going to refer to these dual cone variables with the K here. Then the standard procedure goes as the following. We will write down a uh, Lagrangian, which uh, first is made of the primal functional that we try to maximize. And then we put into the linear constraint, which is imposed by introducing some Lagrange multiplier. Then in addition to this, we add a term, which is the inner product of the primal and the dual cone. And this is strictly non-negative that which is guaranteed by the definition of the dual cone. And so now the Lagrangian is uh, um, some number that's larger than or equal to the primal functional that we want to maximize. Then by rearranging these terms, we want to focus on the coefficients that appear in front of the primal variables and the primal cones. We want to set them to zero such that uh, we remove the dependence of the primal variables from the Lagrangian and get a strict upper bound. And the remaining term defines the dual um, functionals, which after minimization will give us uh, an optimal bound of the primal functional that we want to maximize. After doing this, we have the dual problem, which uh, is parameterized by the dual cones, and uh, we minimize the dual functionals and that is subject to a certain linear constraints, which arise from setting these coefficients to zero. 
So uh, now one issue is that there's no guarantee that the dual linear constraint would have solutions. Um, this depends on the linear operator's age and these coefficient A, which define the primal functional. And in the case of the S matrix problem that we're considering, this will be indeed the case as we'll see later. But for the moment in, um, in this case, the dual problem is infeasible. And the solution is to regularize the primal problem. Before you go to regularization, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, so I guess in, in the bootstrap right now, we are all familiar with linear and with semi-definite uh, programs, but now you are telling us about conic optimization. Is this a partial case of semi-definite or is this like a completely new type of optimization that we have to learn? The, the semi-definite um, optimization, you can write a cone that's a semi-definite cone, I think. So in he, this case is a um, quadratic cone. And yeah, conic yeah. optimization includes many different type of cones. I think semi-definite um, is one of them. But for example, will you be able to solve your problem using SDPB or do you have to use some other solver? Ah, uh, I don't think SDPB would be an efficient way to solve this because the semi-definite cone is more complicated than the quadratic cone. So um, we, we are using some other program for convex optimization in general, but I would think that the uh, Semi uh, maybe I'm wrong, but may I would think that the SDPB would not be very efficient. Okay. Because in this case, you have to rewrite a quadratic cone into some more complicated cone, which, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. So just to be clear, the uh, conic optimization is sort of like a more general thing than the semi-definite optimization. Like the way I understood it, you were saying that semi-definite optimization is a uh, special case of conic optimization. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's my well, understanding. Well, it's a special case, but here we specify a particular quadratic cone. So maybe, like, if you just consider any cone, then it's a special case, any convex cone. But since you are dealing with quadratic cone, one can ask if it's actually not the other way around, if this is a special case of semi definite. Uh, no, it's, it's the other way around. So no, I think this you can put it as semi-definite, but as Ife was saying, it's not probably the best way to solve it. But mm -hmm. you can solve it with SDPB, yes, that's not a problem. But it will take longer, I think, as she was saying. Okay. Thanks. Okay, I will continue. So uh, a solution to the infeasible dual problem is to uh, regularize the primal problem. To do this, um, in addition to the several things that we already write down for the primal problem, we will introduce a norm for the primal variable rho and um, then uh, put a bound on the norm, which we're going to call the regulator. Uh, in the physical context, this will have the meaning of suppressing some oscillations of uh, the double spectral density that has little physical interest. And so after doing this, we'll be able to write down an inequality for some variable theta, which I'm going to call the regularization uh, variable. Uh, so here it, we have some dual dual norm, and um, this is basically the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for the rho and the theta. And then we can go back to the Lagrangian formulation, where we in include two additional terms, which is, again, strictly non-negative because of this inequality here. And so the last term here is another coefficient that appears in front of rho, and this will modify the original dual constraint that we have before. Uh, and we obtain the dual constraint after the regularization. But in this case, it's not really a constraint because it just defines what this regularization variable is in terms of these coefficient, the kernel, and the dual cone. So uh, it does not need to be solved. And then the other term will add an additional term to the dual functional, uh, which we're going to minimize together. So in this case, we arrive at a dual problem that is feasible. <clears throat> so I have stated this uh, procedure in a discrete language, but the continuous version followed the same logic. And uh, uh, in this case, the 
double spectral density, which is the primal parameter, uh, has indices x and y, which goes from four to infinity. And um, it's related to the partial waves in a linear relation with the usual um, unitarity constraint. And to regularize, we introduce some norm for the row and uh, a regulator to bound the norm. For the dual problem, um, it's parameterized with the dual cone, and in the continuous version, it carried the indices uh, L, which is the angular momentum, and the S, which is the energy in the physical region. And uh, this, this is the same as the previous page that I said. And using this to define the uh, regularization variable theta in this case is parameterized, it has the indices X and Y, which are the same for the row. And uh, then the problem uh, to solve is to give a regulator M reg, and then the maximum of the primal will agree with the minimum of the dual. And uh, in practice, oh, I forgot to mention that this dual cone uh, variable, I'm going to call it the dual partial waves uh, for a reason that will become more clear later. But um, in practice, we will do this for uh, many different regulators. And as we increase the regulator, uh, the primal maximal will reach a plateau and so is the dual um, minimum. Suppose the boundary of the space is indicated with this line here, then at the plateau, uh, numerically the primal maximum will reach it from below and the dual will reach it from above. <clears throat> And when the primal agrees with the dual, uh, we are at the boundary of the space. And in this case, there's an equality between the primal and the dual cone, uh, which is basically saying that they are uh, perpendicular. And uh, from this, we'll be able to write down the primal cone variable, which are the partial scattering uh, amplitude and also the partial waves in terms of the dual partial waves. And in this sense, the dual partial waves have all the physical informations of the physical partial waves, and is therefore also a good description of the bootstrap problem. Uh, one subtlety is that this condition can only uh, this can only be done when the unitarity constraint is saturated. So it's an um, interesting open question how to generalize this to the case that we don't have unitarity saturation. <clears throat> The case of ON is uh, slightly more complicated, but um, very similar. Uh, in this case, we have three amplitudes that uh, correspond to the three different isospin channels, uh, I equals to zero, one, two. And in terms of the double dispersion relation, this corresponds to several spectral density, which we're going to label with the additional index uh, uh, alpha. And then again, the primal functional are in general written in this form. And then it's related, the row is related to uh, the partial waves with a certain ISO spin uh, in terms of a linear relation where again, the operator here encodes all the properties of analyticity and crossing. We, ha we have the uh, unitarity for each ISO spin, angular momentum and each energy. And uh, to regularize it, we will write the, will introduce a norm to this double spectral density row with a certain regulator. <clears throat> For the dual in this case, uh, in addition to what we, I have said before, we have an extra index uh, that gives the ISO spin for the dual partial waves. And then on the other hand, the, regular, the regularization variable theta will have an extra index alpha, which correspond to the alpha for row. <clears throat> And in this uh, notation here, the sum over uh, isospin and the uh, angular momentum are such that for isospin zero and two, we have e even partial waves. And for isospin one, we have odd ones, which are a result of um, crossing symmetry. <clears throat> so up to this point, we have basically uh, derived the dual problem. Um, but now I'm going to redo this using complex analysis uh, so that we can resolve some issues that was answered before. <clears throat> can, I, can I ask a question first? Yeah. You mentioned that you get uh, 
an amplitude that saturates unitarity, but I thought that was impossible. You cannot saturate unitarity everywhere. On the previous uh, I mean, this is a analytically. So, I, are you referring to this slide here? Yes. Ah, okay. So, what I'm trying to say here is that when the primal is equal to the dual, then uh, we have this equality here, which is um, either that unitarity is saturated or the K is zero for a certain angular momentum at a certain range of energy. And so, uh, if it's a unitarity saturation, then in that case, we can write S in terms of some K. But if uh, this the, this condition is met because k is zero at some point, then we cannot do this. Um, we cannot write uh, the primal variables in terms of the dual. So this is just analytical um, unitarity right. saturation. I'm, I'm not sure if I answered the question. Yeah, but what do you actually see? Do you see that in some ranges, uh, k is equal to zero? Ah. Uh, yeah, so if you do the numerics, uh, I think you would see sometimes, okay, let me think. I think you can observe at some point K is equal to zero. Okay. So, so you, 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 you're also going to work with a finite number of these uh, dual partial waves, I imagine, right? In applications. Yes, yes. So even, even if uh, they were never zero, you are not saying anything about the high spin behavior. So it doesn't no. mean that you're actually getting an S matrix. You're just getting a finite set of partial waves satisfying unitarity. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, but I mean, when the dual converges very well for low energy, uh, low partial waves, it gives pretty good description of the, the primal. I mean, it will be, Approximate, but but it's uh, when the dual converges, it's a good description. Yeah, yeah, I think it's just Bolt was referring to. There's this proof that basically uh, crossing symmetry implies particle production somewhere. So you mm. can you cannot have an S matrix that's not free, that does not have particle production. So, but it's not inconsistent with what. Ah, what okay. So I mean, the, this is this allows unitarity on saturation. But numerically, you have not uh, looked this into more detail. I mean, the ones that we observed are unitar the unitarity is saturated, but uh, the formalism allows for unitarity on saturation for the reason that I said before that. Yeah, because it can be zero at certain points. Yeah. Okay. Just, just to confirm, this primal equal this saturation, uh, this is even when you have in the presence of a regulator. This is still true, this equation. Uh, this is for a fixed regulator, for but fixed regulator. Mm -hmm. I mean, for a fixed regulator, then the dual problem is feasible. So uh, when you have uh, the primal and the dual are feasible, then uh, the duality gap always closes. But in our case, we are really interested in this plateau, which is basically uh, saying that the regulator is very large. And so, um, yeah. But even if even if you have finite regulator, what uh, what property of the S matrix are you violating? Right, you're still obeying crossing and analyticity and unitarity. It's still a very a good S matrix even at finite value of the regulator, right? You mean before the plateau? Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, I, it, you're not violating anything for. I mean, she's not getting a, an S matrix for all spins. I, I didn't understand the questions. Can I ask what? another question? Yeah, because I'm still confused. Like, what's the status? What 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 would happen if you just ran your numerics without regulator? Um. <clears throat> I think the numerics do. doesn't doesn't like it. <laughs> what do you mean you think? <laughs> I mean, okay, of course I we Can try. You try to... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, for our numerics, it's gonna complain that uh, the it's not feasible. I mean, it will tell you things like the duo is not feasible or things like that. 
I see. So even though you reach the plateau, but I, I'm surprised about this plateau thing because suppose that this rod density has some delta function somewhere. Delta function, I don't know which norm do you use for the regulator, but I assume it's some sort of L2 norm. So the uh, delta function is not an L2. So, I, so it means that- In you our case, the, the road does not have delta function because we're having some, um, we, we don't have bound state. It's uh, just, um, it just- Okay, for, I mean, just pick some other singularity which is integral, but not L2 integrable. You have in the right hand side of this uh, uh, equations, you have integrals. So Roy is allowed to have integrable singularities, which are not all too integrable in principle. Okay. So if something like that were to happen, then uh, yeah, depending on what norm you use, you would probably not never reach a plateau. Um, it's not something you've seen. No, no, I mean, the, the precise norm is not very important, I think. I mean, that only influences how fast you get to the plateau. But um, um, yeah, I'm not sure. But don't you also have to increase the regulator to, to, to reach this plateau? Uh, isn't it dependent also on the number of partial waves that you include? Uh, what, what so do you if mean? You, if, if you include more spins in your dual problem, yes, more else, don't you need to, to do you need to push this uh, regulator further up? No, no, the, the, the plateau is basically equivalent to that the regulator is removed numerically. So, um, I'm saying fix, fix, fix the fix the so regulator in, uh, in the in the regular uh, in the minimization here we have a norm of theta right so when you include more and more dual partial waves you manage to make this smaller and smaller so the regulator in the dual is basically try to make this data very small and that's that's where the plateau is but does the position of the plateau depend on how many spins you include the position of the plateau, you mean in terms of the regulator? Yeah. Uh, at this, this where it appears uh, depends on a lot of things, what kind of norm you use or, uh, but uh, we are not interested in um, before the plateau. We just care about the value after the plateau. No, but I, I, I think this has relevance for Slava's question, right? Because, uh... A delta function has overlap with infinitely many spins. So of course, if you're just considering a finite number of spins, then you could truncate this delta function in sense. Then. But uh, so I, I, I think that one way you could get around this then is uh, uh, as you increase the number of spins, you'd have to push this, this M to reach the plateau, you'd have to go further and further up. But hopefully we will see some numer actual numerical plots rather than caricatures. Okay, so I will follow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, to uh, the, so now um, so for the complex analysis part, I'm going to first start with uh, deriving some um, some relation that we call the a generalized dispersion relation. We start by considering um, analytic function of two variables with um, which is given by a double dispersion relation like this. And the singularities are all, uh, all possible singularities are on the real axis, which could include uh, poles or cuts. Uh, and then one can compute this double spectral density in the usual way. Mm, and depending on where the double spectral density has support, this the, the, the size, the analytic structure of this, um, this function. And then uh, we can see that uh, the following identity hold. If uh, we take one of the variables slightly above or below the cut and then integrate from negative to infinity, we'll get zero. This can be seen if we just close the contour from infinity and drop the contribution at infinity. Suppose that's okay. And then we can consider a product of two analytic functions uh, like this. One we call H and the other one we call K. 
And using this identity here, we'll be able to find a formula like this. This relates uh, two terms. One is uh, involved the double spectral density of the first function, and therefore uh, is integrated in the region where that has support. And the second term involved the double spectral density of the second function, and therefore is integrated in the region where that has support. And we're going to call this a uh, generalized dispersion relation for the reason that we're, we will take the first function to be from the amplitude and the second function to uh, something that we call a dual amplitude. And by choosing carefully the analytic structure of the dual amplitude, we'll be able to uh, use this formula to relate the value of the amplitude at some point to its value in the physical region. So let's see how to uh, use this. Uh, I'm, for simplicity, I'm going to choose the first function h to be this st part of the amplitude, which uh, where the double spectral density has support for s larger than 4 and t larger than 4. And then for the dual amplitude, we'll choose the following uh, analytic structure. The first term is a pole at s. Uh, s equals to s naught and t equals to t naught, which can take the value between 0 and 4, which is inside the so-called Mandelstam region, sorry, Mandelstam triangle. And this is where we would like to evaluate the amplitude. And then the other term is a double integral in the physical region corresponding to s larger than 4 and t between 4 minus s and 0, which here I'm indicating with green. And using the formula that we write from the previous page, this generalized uh, dispersion relation, we can write the amplitude evaluated at S0, T0 uh, in terms of two terms. Uh, the first one is an integration in the physical region, because this is where the double spectral density for the dual amplitude has support. And the second term is an integration in the Mandelstam region, where rho has um, support. And uh, what we want to do is to find the bound of this quantity. And uh, now the idea is very similar to 2D. We would like to uh, eliminate the um, uh, primal quantities from this expression and therefore obtain some strict upper bound of the quantity that we want to maximize. In the physical region, we're going to use the fact that the amplitude can be written as a sum over the partial waves, which is subject to unitarity constraint. And for the Mandelstam region, we'll use uh, the regularization, which uh, we have a certain norm for the row and uh, some uh, regulator that bounds the norm. So, <clears throat> Now in the physical region, we're going to define uh, the dual partial waves, uh, which are the double spectral density for the dual amplitude projected onto a certain angular momentum. After this definition, this first term uh, in the in physical region is written like this. And then we'll be able to use a series of inequalities, which in particular includes unitarity to remove S from this expression and find a, a strict upper bound, which is written in terms of the dual partial waves. And then for the other term, we'll call this real K uh, in the Mandelstam region theta of x, y, and then use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And in particular, we will have the norm, the bound of the norm, which comes from the regularization to remove the row and then find a bound on this term. And the result of this, uh, after we take into account the cross regions, in, in the case of single pion is this dual functional, which is written in terms of the dual partial waves. And then the, regulate, the regularization variable theta uh, is defined using the dual partial waves in this way, which is just comes from the definition of the dual amplitude. From this, we reproduce the conic optimization derivation. And also this, can, this is uh, easily generalized to the case of OM very straightforwardly. <clears throat> so the last issue we want to um, resolve is uh, I claimed before that the dual uh, linear constraint before regularization is infeasible. And uh, in this complex analysis, um, um, 
way of writing the problem, we identify this regularization variable theta of x, y as uh, the real part of the dual amplitude evaluated in the Mandel stem region x larger than 4 and t, uh, y larger than 4. And then from the definition of the dual amplitude, it can be written in this form. And uh, the, the dual linear constraint uh, without regularization is such that we want to set this to be zero for every x and y for uh, in the Mandel's dump region, which would imply that uh, for all y larger than four, we have an equality of two uh, functions, which comes from the two forms, uh, two terms here. The function on the left is defines an analytic function in, uh, of y, uh, which has a cut from negative infinity to zero. And the function on the right is an analytic function in y, which has a pole at uh, y equals to t naught. And setting them equal to zero is saying that uh, these two functions agree precisely for the range y from four to infinity which is not possible because if they agree precisely in this range, then by analytic continuation, they will agree everywhere. But on the left-hand side, we have an um, analytic function on the cut plane. And on the right-hand side, we have an analytic function with a pole at t naught. So in this sense, the dual uh, problem without regularization is infeasible. But this is only uh, weakly infeasible in the sense that um, we, one can um, adjust the spectral density on the left-hand side to approximate the uh, right-hand side for the range of four to infinity very close. And so in the, um, this is basically what the dual problem, the minimization of the norm of theta is trying to do. <clears throat> So now I will discuss the numerical implementation. Uh, so we are we want to minimize the dual functional that's given in this form, uh, which in this case is for a single pion. And this is parameterized by the dual partial waves for a certain angular momentum and some range of uh, and the energy. And we'll truncate the sum here and do the integration numerically. For the dual partial waves, we can choose the basis uh, of functions with which is characterized by a certain number of coefficients. And then as we increase the number of coefficients, um, we will increase the, the parameter space for the dual problem and then gradually approach the boundary of the space of S matrices from outside. So don't you have to choose what are the analyticity properties of these KLs as you approach S goes to four or S goes to infinity? Uh, I mean, I think uh, we, we did not look into too much detail of that, but I think the basic idea is that uh, you, you, since it appears, I mean, the KL of S is the uh, double spectral density here projected onto some angular momentum. So if you invert this relation, it's this K of ST is a sum over the K, which is very similar to the, case of the primal function, uh, the primal amplitude, which is sum over the partial waves. And so you just want this sum to converge. And um, for numerical implementation, it's um, we choose some nice KL of S. I, I guess I'm asking if, don't, wouldn't you risk running into the same problem here, depending on whether you say that whether KL, when S goes to four, whether it goes down like a power law or like a square root or whatever. Uh, what is the problem? Not necessarily a problem, but I mean, for us, uh, in, in the problem that you described, it was important to pick the right basis of functions with the right singularities near threshold to get better convergence. But it seems like here, potentially, you could also improve convergence or make it worse by picking a different basis of functions for these KLS. Ah, OK. Uh, I mean, so, <clears throat> so uh, I mean, we have tried different basis of this dual partial waves and some converges better, some converges com converge worse. And, uh, and we find one good set is uh, since at the duality gap closing, we will expect this relation to hold. And so you would want to have some partial waves, du dual partial waves that give you 
for example, the real analyticity, real analyticity for the primal partial waves. So you can choose some dual partial waves that give you some um, with the right uh, real analyticity property. So it's it's the the issue. The, the the thing is that the better dual partial waves you choose, the better you converge to the 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 boundary of the space. But you can also you may also choose some worse ones that uh, doesn't converge to that point. Not sure if I answered the question. No, no, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, and numerically, we observe that uh, only a few dual partial waves are needed for um, getting a good convergence. And uh, this is very much like what's happening in uh, experiments, for example, where only a few partial waves are measured. So in this sense, we think that the dual problem has some practical and physical advantages over the primal problem for the S-matrix bootstrap. Sorry, so now I I'm- think it depends, Sorry, if I think it depends on the observable in the sense that your, your, the observable that you're looking at uh, uh, is basically a spin zero effect we know it from the primal but for instance if you look at the minimum coupling i would expect yeah. that this is not true that you should get contributions from uh, i don't know your bound will depend uh, strongly on spin two spin four and so on for instance uh you're commenting on the a few partial waves thing yeah i think ah, it's, okay. uh, it, it depends on the observable that okay. you're uh, looking at yeah. Okay, I mean, we, we didn't do a lot of tests numerical yet. Uh, we're doing, uh, we're going to do more, but uh, for the moment, that's what we observed. Yeah, I'm saying that uh, for this observable, this was expected even from, for, from prime, from a primal. But the primal so problem, good. you have to impose many partial ways to guarantee some good convergence, right? Like for, uh, for us, the, the numerical examples I'm going to show, we have only like four dual partial waves. And because no. of this few number of par dual partial waves that uh, one needs, you can now put a lot of interpolation points to describe this uh, quantity better. No, I'm not talking about convergence, I'm talking about some rule. In the sense that this observable, if you okay. write some rule for this observable, you see that basically contributes only to spin zero. If you write a fixed dispersion relation, you write uh, some rule, you see that appears all in spin zero, then the higher okay. spin implements uh, more and more crossing constraints. So okay. I would expect that uh, if you compute this, um, the, this quartic coupling as an integral, you will get the spin zero, which is almost all the contribution, then the higher spins will give you like a small uh, correction. That's okay. The, this is like my intuition, but uh, okay. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to show some uh, numerical results. Uh, as a first test, we considered this problem that was originally considered in this paper that we mentioned at the beginning of maximizing uh, the amplitude at the crossing symmetric point, where, uh, as we said before, that the maximum is attained by a solution with um, threshold pole, which I'm plotting in uh, this blue line here. And then for the primal and the dual, we do not assume this threshold pole and we increase the regulator until both the primal and the dual reach some plateau. And uh, then we see that the primal converge to the optimal solution from below and the dual from above. And uh, we can look at some more zoomed in view of this region on the plateau. Here, the primal, uh, the points correspond to 60, 100, and 160 interpolation points, and the dual are for uh, 16 to 128 number of coefficients with the four dual partial waves, and the dual converge very nicely to this uh, the, 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 the primal solution assuming the pole. <clears throat> And one can also, for example, do some extrapolation of these data to an infinite number of coefficients. And uh, the primal, uh, if you do, if we do a linear extrapolation uh, for the few data that I'm showing before, then the vertical axis here correspond to infinite number of coefficients, which you see that um, it approached uh, the bound from below, but uh, still a bit distance from it but the dual without doing any 
uh, extrapolation, it converged nicely to the, the blue line. So as a further test, we, do, we did the maximization of uh, the amplitude for a line inside the mandel sum triangle for s equals to t from zero to four and obtain these uh, plots here. Uh, again, the blue line are given by the primal problem, assuming a threshold pole and uh, the red and the blue, sorry, red and green are the primal and the dual without assuming this threshold pole. And, uh, and again, we see that the primal and the dual converge to this line from both sides. Here, we also plotted the um, uh, in this black diamond, the old results from the 1970s from Lopez and Manessia. And uh, this plot is a more zoomed in view of this um, region near crossing symmetric point. And uh, the primal is still some distance from the blue curve, but the dual, uh, the green dots are converging to this um, line here. And as a simple observation, we see that the minimum of this curve is located at the crossing symmetric point, which is uh, probably um, follow from the argument of symmetry. So now I'm going to conclude. Uh, we have formulated the dual problem for a regularized three plus one dimensional S matrix bootstrap. And in doing this, we introduced the concepts of um, dual amplitudes and the dual partial waves. And we see that the dual problem has some practical and physical advantages over the primal problem. And by combining the primal and the dual uh, together, we'll be able to bracket, bracket the boundary of the space of S matrices. And this should provide some useful tool to further explore the space of S matrices in three plus one dimensions. And I will stop here. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Ethan, can, can you describe a bit better the, the numerical procedure? So you had a slide about that, but if you could give a bit more detail. So when you, yes, here. So here, when okay. you set up, you, you parameterize each KL from zero up to some maximum value of the spin, L max. Mm -hmm. uh, so. So and KL of S in this function is there any constraint in these functions, and then the, how do you so first there is no constraint here. So uh, the KL uh, so here there is a real KL and imaginary KL, and you can choose a basis of functions uh, for uh, of S for each of the partial waves. And so for example, you can choose real to be cosine and. Uh, imagine to be sine. I mean some some property that's nicely reproducing the primal real analyticity property. And then in as you increase, uh, I mean, sine of, uh, sine of n times the angle, which is the upper half circle of the, uh, the disk. And then um, what you want to do is to, I mean, you want to consider a few partial waves here. And then, um, um, I mean, after you use the basis functions, it's parameterized by some coefficients. And then the careful thing here is you have to do this numerical integration very carefully to make sure that it's enough to, um, because here we want this to be continuous. Uh, so you have to make sure you have enough points to do the numerical integration for the basis functions that you have. You have. And then the theta here is uh, defined through this previous relation, which is just calculated from the K, and then you do the minimization. There's more details in our paper. Okay, th thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I have some nagging feeling that I, it's something I don't understand because you introduced this regulator. Yes. So by introducing the regulator, uh, we, we regulate is an extra constraint on the primal problem. So the, the primal regulated problem, the maximum of the primal regulated problem is smaller than the actual maximum. Mm. Then, okay, then the dual problem 
the minimum of the dual problem should also be smaller than the actual extremum that you're trying to find. Yeah, for a finite regulator. Yeah, for but... finite regulator. But but you did but all the in all the plots that you have shown, the green dots were approaching uh, from above. Why is I it mean... that you did not have any? Oh, okay. Well, okay. The previous plot here, here. Okay. Okay. Here. These so are at the, the plateau. Well, so, it's not a, well, it's not a pla it's not an exact plateau, right? It's still growing. So, uh, uh, w where does it grow? Well, it seems to me that the green points are are are. Uh, if you have a bad um, um, basis that you start with, it might not be a good plateau. But as you increase the parameter space, it will reach some plateau. You think it should actually be exactly constant? Uh, yes, I mean, but, if but there is like a systematic drift. If you go to the previous plot, it's very visible that the green dots they keep growing a little bit. Ah, okay. So this is um, uh, because numerically, at some point, uh, uh, for better plateau, you need to make sure you have. I mean, for primal problem, problem, if um, numerically you want to have better plateau, you need to make sure you have enough unitarity constraint. Which for the dual, I would imagine that correspond to the number of interpolation points but yeah i'm i'm just thinking you know how to picture this so so the the guys who are working with the primal problem mm. well the guys and the girls as well they always had this uh, thing that okay they had to they were uh, they were always complaining that the bounds that they were obtaining were not rigorous bounds because it was like okay you have to increase one thing that but you also have to increase the other thing it's like a a game so now you introduce this regulator but and now you're saying that on the one hand you have this nice plateau but there is still a little bit of an aspect of the game which remains because for any finite regulator it looks like your bound is not uh, quite rigorous so you think it's going to be improved because you can do, avoid discretization like it has been done for the bootstrap ev eventually uh, so. uh, maybe i didn't completely understand but but the, the point is that this prop the dual problem is, is weakly infeasible in the sense that when you increase the regulator large enough it will be like removing the regulator so yeah. that's why there's a plateau here but but the guys in the old days they they obtained rigorous bounds. These guys whom you whom you quoted, uh, they put ah. a dot on your final plot. So I why mean, is it they... that they they obtained rigorous bounds forty years ago, and here we are still like going around in circles? The problem is weakly infeasible. If it's like infeasible, how did they get rigorous bounds? They they I I think they do not have a full crossing symmetry, if I understand correctly. Um, I mean, the Lopez Manesia has uh, has the uh, some fixed t dispersion fi fixed t dispersion relation, which does not impose the full crossing symmetry. Okay, but do they have a rigorous bound? Maybe they did not impose the full set of constraints, but is their bound rigorous or not? Uh, is their bound rigorous or not? Yeah. I think it is. So, 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 okay. So then it means that if you pose some subset of constraints, then uh, you can get rigorous bounds. And, but if you impose all constraints like you are trying to do here, well, the point is that you, we you, want you to have to sacrifice this rigor. And I question my question is, is, can, is there something intermediate? Like, I think the you... point is that other than rigorous bound, you also want to get some optimal bound so that you can actually converge to the boundary of the space. So, I mean, if you really want to get some rigorous bounds, just release a lot of constraint, then that's what you have. I mean, maybe I didn't understand what you're trying the to say. The question is, is there a hierarchy of rigorous bounds which approaches the blue line? Ah. Mm. Currently, we have one rigorous bound, and we have a bunch of non-rigorous bounds. I mean, you can take m to infinity, and that's a rigorous bound. But numerically, you always have to compromise. Okay. So it means that you don't have a rigorous bound. 
No, if m goes to infinity, it's rigorous. Mathematically rigorous. The limit of m goes to infinity of that quantity is an upper bound. But then how do you evaluate? Then I think if you look at the plateau, you have to believe that if you keep increasing m, it's not going to go up again. That's an act of faith, I guess. That's what I'm saying. No, but that's a numerical evaluation. Okay, so when you do the open result Menesia, is three of these caveats. No, when you do Lopez Menezes, you also have to believe the numerics. But so one is the mathematical bound, and then when you evaluate it numerically. Okay. So you have to prove that at every numerical step, you didn't make any mistake to go down if you want. But yeah, I think that Lopez and Menesse, they have an analytic expression that depends on a few parameters that they vary. But uh, I think that uh, for any choice, how to say, for any value of the parameters in some constraints, they yeah, get like here styles. put it a very small subset of KLs and then you get a like upper bound. You see here that they say you are really up because you put a very few, let's say KLs. But no. in, in, in this case, if you, the problem you can have is you start putting many KLs and then you don't evaluate the integral precisely because you have to evaluate it numerically. But if you were, if you could evaluate the integral exactly, then I think it will be an upper bound. No, but you, you said that it's impossible to get for you a rigorous bound because you always have to work at a finite value of regulator. So somehow they managed to do to get an actual bound, which did not depend on any regulator. So they managed to find an expression where the limit taken to the regulator was taken to infinity. You get a finite expression, and then you start looking at it, computing it, and so on. So it, it seems to me that there, there is still, I see it, you know, it's nice that people try various things, but I still don't see how to uh, to be like fair, it still seems to be that there are different uh, methods in place. Sorry, sorry. To be fair, they also had some dual constraints to satisfy. They had like infinite dual constraints to satisfy anyway, to be fair. Okay, but did they, they manage to satisfy them? Satisfied. Uh, yes, for the function that they construct, they managed to satisfy all these okay, constraints. But, but for this problem, Yifei told us that if she removes the regulator, then her problem becomes dual infeasible, and so she will not be able to satisfy the constraint. So how come is it that for you it's dual infeasible, but for them it was dual feasible? Can I ask maybe a related question? No, I mean, if, if this was feasible, they would get the upper bound equal to the exact value. No, dual feasible means you, any point that you find which, is, uh, which satisfies dual feasibility, it provides you a valid upper bound. Yeah, no, but it is theorem that the lower bound of the dual problem is equal to the upper bound of the primer. No, no. There, is, there are two things. There's duality gap, which is non-negative. And then there is, you know, if you find a dual feasible problem, it provides you a, a valid bound independently of whether, whether the duality gap vanishes or not. Ah, yes, yeah, but I'm saying that it has, uh, this theorem says that it has to vanish. So you have to be able to find some solution that. Okay. So I, I thought that your premise was at the very beginning that you have to introduce the regulator, otherwise the problem is dual and feasible. Well, some other, peop other people 40 years ago found some formulation which was dual feasible without any regulator. So isn't there a still a sign? Oh, yeah, but not the dual. Yeah, I guess uh, you're saying it's not the dual. I mean, they, they did something else. I, guess. I mean, their case is not uh, fully crossing symmetric. It doesn't matter. It means that they dropped some constraints. So it's maybe a subset of your problem. No, no, no. If, if you release the crossing symmetry, then you are getting bigger space in the primal and then the dual will converge to that point and that's the dual minimum. Yes, I think in our opinion, the, the, we want to solve the primal with the regulator. Now, it would be nice to find some physical reason for the regulator, but 
I think that with the regulator is a better primal. I don't know. But uh, anyway, I, I reached. So maybe Andrea wanted to also ask something. Yeah, no, I should not. Okay, sorry. So can I ask a very naive question? You said M equals one at the beginning. Is this the only mass scale in the problem? Uh, sorry? The... Well, you set the masses of the particles equal to one. Yes. I just wondered, is there any other mass scale potentially in the problem coming from the regulator or somewhere else? Mm. I don't know because we don't understand what the physical meaning of the regulator. I mean, in the real world for pions, there's two mass scales, one the mass of the pion and then there's the QCD lambda. Ah. Uh. I yeah, think that's sure. like the mass of the proton, but we are not putting that. Yeah, but in the Pi Pi channels, the mass of the rho would appear somewhere, and this is determined by lambda. Ah, yeah, but the question is, do you need the input the mass of the proton and do a bootstrap with that to get the rho at the correct place, or is just from pi on physics? Yeah, I don't know. Well, it means there's more than one mass scan. I mean, QCD has only, as you said, lambda QCD and the quark mass, if you assume that they say the U and D have the same mass. So you only have, the, you have to set the ratio between lambda QCD and the quark mass. And I think sure, that's the same in your problem, the, you, effectively you're choosing the mass of the quarks composing the pions to be one. More yeah, so less. you need to put the proton to get the other mass scale. Or you need to find some other way, yeah, like uh, fix something else, like some uh, scattering lengths or some other thing. Well, the scattering lengths are determined uh, by chiral symmetry in terms of f pi squared, which in turn is determined by lambda. Yeah, so you could, you can, you have to introduce if you want another scale, or if you want to do a, be a purist, you have to put a pi on some protons and see if everything comes out from there. But depends on how you want to approach. But yeah, you need to put another scale if you want. Yeah. Any further questions? Can you, um, can you, sorry, Andrea, you, you've been trying for a while. So why don't you go first? <laughs> no, but it's very, okay. We maybe can try that. Uh, sorry. Um, at some point, uh, so at some point, I think that you have to exchange some sum over spin with some integrals and so on. Are you worried about the region of convergence of the partial wave expansion at any step or uh, but the, sensitive? The, uh, this is in the physical region. So the partial wave sum converges. Always. Uh, no, I mean, I know that in the physical region, but you are always in the physical region in your integrations. Uh, you are never integrating. Uh... I mean, I think what you're referring to, oh, I cannot see my slide anymore. Um, I think what you're referring to is uh, maybe here that uh, you will have, um, I mean, first we write the sum of uh, sorry, the amplitude in this region as a sum over the partial waves. And then this integration is done in the physical region. So the sum is convergent. I see, I see. Oh, I see, okay, yeah. And then can I ask maybe another very fast question just to understand? Mm. Um, about the fact that you have to set uh, something to zero. I saw some integral from minus infinity to zero in the T. Yeah. Uh, ju just to understand, is that because uh, some, you would get like a spin dependent singularity set threshold when you go in higher impartial weights? That's why you need to set this, uh, you need to set this object to zero in some region. Is that the reason, like close to four? Uh, I, I didn't understand the question. The, you are, 
Okay, can you repeat? Okay, I, I'm saying that I see this integration from minus infinity to zero in the yes. T. Yes. That is not dependent anymore on X. And I was yes. wondering if this will, would uh, give you, when you expand uh, F in partial waves, it would give you um, singularities, like spin dependent singularities. I, yeah. I, I still didn't understand the question, sorry. Did, Martin, did you understand? Uh, sorry, no, maybe he can repeat. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay, maybe it's... No, okay, okay, it's, it's okay, okay, I need to think more about it. Okay, sorry. I mean, we, I we want to set this to zero for the reason that if we can really set it to zero, then you can basically remove this term from this expression and then it's completely bounded by unitarity. But then the, weak, uh, the weakly infeasible thing says that this is not possible. So we still have this term and um, maybe that oh, doesn't matter. Okay. So, but then if it does, uh, oh. but then does it depend on rho, your bound? No, because we put a regulator and then the regulator, uh, yeah, this is a thing that we were saying that when the regulator is large enough, then it's like removing the regulator. Oh, I see. Okay, thanks, I understand. Sorry for this silly question. No, no, sorry. <laughs> So, okay. um, Lopez and Menessier, they only assumed proven analyticity, right? I think that is the main difference between what they did and what you guys are doing. You're, you're assuming maximal analyticity. Mm. So their assumptions seem to be, uh, I mean, to me at least, that seems like the, the main difference, that their assumptions are um, like, of the analyticity properties are those that, uh, that have been proven. And, okay, uh, but they have a. I, I I thought they did not have the full STU crossing symmetry. Also, yeah, but if you assume less, your dual problem becomes more feasible. Yeah, yeah, of course. So if 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 you if they had the dual problem which was feasible, it means that your problem by assuming more should become even more feasible. While well, you are saying that your problem is infeasible, so that's a contradiction. No, 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 no. Dual no, no. infeasible. The, the, I, 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 they are releasing some constraints. So the parameter yeah. space is bigger. And the, the thing is that the primal variables are equivalent to the dual constraints. So when you have a bigger primal space, then you have a more constrained dual space. You have a smaller primal space because you impose more constraints. No, we did so not dual, impose more constraints. Your dual constraint. space is bigger. No, 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 it's the opposite. Anyway, my question was um, whether, um, like you, you assumed this double dispersion relation, but whether you can, you can get, uh, but you've gotten somewhere with, with um, trying to get bounds a la <clears throat> Lopez and Menessier. Um, using only uh, axiomatically proven analyticity. So for example, I think it would be nice to have the kind of curve that you had. Okay. Um, uh, as an upper so... bound on the amplitude as a function of this, uh, of say S. Um, <clears throat> but then proven, uh, using only proven analyticity, is there something like that? Um... So, so can you remind me what is the range of analyticity that's proven? I think the problem is the numerical implementation, how you parameterize this. And if you, I mean, I think it's uh, for this problem, you can formulate a dual problem. And uh, I would imagine that in this case, you have a smaller dual space. I would guess so. Yeah. Um... I think 
I mean, it, it would be nice, but uh, I don't think now is the right time to give you uh, or to, to, to give everybody a lecture on, on the proven analyticity properties. Joao, well, uh, I want to continue the discussion. Uh, apparently, we can leave the Zoom on, but perhaps I think it is a good time to end the recording of the seminar. Okay, thank you.